Now, God, how we bless and praise your name tonight. So many wonderful things about you. So many marvelous acts. God, we say thank you. Before we ask you of anything, we got to first thank you for everything. So many things you've done. So many wonderful works. So many marvelous acts. God, we invite your presence tonight as we attempt to preach and teach your word that your people will leave blessed. We will leave the better. Don't let us leave like we can. Those that are viewing in, Lord, we pray that your Shekinah glory, your spirit, will shine down upon them and rest in their home or wherever they may be. We know that your power transition airways, your power transition radio waves, your power transition space and time. We know you are everywhere at the same time. So Lord, move with your grace, with your power. Touch us tonight. Heal us tonight by way of your word. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your presence tonight while you're yet resting on your feet, while you're yet standing. I have a quick scripture we want to invite your attention to. going to be in another series of messages. And uh, we're going to focus on the teachings of Christ, the teachings of Jesus. And so we'll begin in the book of Matthew, his first lesson that he taught his disciple. Matthew chapter 5, uh, beginning with verse 3, but let's take 1, 2, and 3. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. And we'll do these three verses responsibly. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. And seeing the multitude, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Together. Amen. I want to take text with the subject on how to live a blessed life. How to live a blessed life. One of the things that we keep hearing over and over again, and that is, I'm trying to live my best life. I, I, I want to live my best life. But your best life may not necessarily be a blessed life because you can have materials, you can have things, and not be blessed. It has nothing to do with the material, but it has everything to do with the spiritual. And I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I want to live a blessed life. How do we live a blessed life? Is it about saving money? Of course, Scripture declares that money answers all things. There are some things money can do, but money can only go so far. Is it exercising and eating right? And I will tell you, exercising and eating right does make you feel better. 
I don't know if it'll give you extended life, but uh, the statistics show that if you eat right and exercise, there's a good possibility you'll have extended life. Is it going to church and loving your neighbor and doing the right thing and living righteously? I hold there are some benefits in going to church and uh, living right and loving your neighbor. But is it necessarily a blessed life? Is it necessarily your best life? Because there are many books out now on how to live your best life. We want to maximize life. We want to get the best out of life. Especially speaking to those of us who are over 50. We, we, we want to max our life. We want to get the best out of our life. So how do we get there? I shared with the noon Bible study that God is interested in the details of your life. Uh, the book of Leviticus reminds us God is concerned about what we eat, how we dress, and who we hang out with. We want to take control over the details of our lives. And we also want to take control of the direction of our life. But we still want to make it to our destination. And I hold if you're going to get to your destination, living your blessed life and best life, you've got to surrender details and directions to God. We just can't do it our way. We have to do it his way and tell him to take control over the details of our life, over the directions of our life so that we can reach the destiny that God has for us. Jesus begins his early ministry, teaching his disciples. Now we like preaching, but we need teaching. It's just something about when you put school, institution, people just kind of run away from teaching. But it seems that your stronger churches are your churches where there is a lot of teaching going on. We need to be taught. We need to slow down enough to be taught. It is said preaching brings you out of the world, but the teaching brings the world out of you. And for many of us, change don't take place until we are taught and shown the word of God ourselves. And when we can see it and embrace it for ourselves, then change will take place. Many times we get caught up in the emotion of preaching. I like preaching. I enjoy preaching. I think I'm more of a preacher than teaching, but a good preacher going to have some good teaching. And a good teacher going to have some good preaching. I, I, I believe they go hand in hand. However, we must discipline ourselves to just hear the word of God without a hoop or a holler, without an organ or instrument, just the word of God. When was the last time you shouted at the house? Just on the word alone. It is the word that should inspire you. It is the word that should motivate you. What is Jesus saying in his word? 
here is the tragedy. Many call themselves Christians, but they have no idea of what it means. They know nothing about his teaching. They ignore what he says. They have not invested or investigated what he is saying as it relates to being a Christian. And we call ourselves Christ-like and we don't know what he was like. We don't know what he said. And so the Holy Spirit led me to do this series of messages just on what Christ taught what he taught, his teachings to his disciples. He gives this word, which is called and known to be the Sermon on the Mountain. But it really should be the lesson on the mountain. Listen how it starts. Seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, when he got himself together, he called for his disciples. His disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. This is also known as the beatitude also relates to our attitude or the attitude that we should have. And tragically again, there are many Christians who just got some bad attitude. It, it ain't nobody in here, but, but there are some saints who just got some, some bad attitude. But I watch urchins sometimes in worship and they tell folks to scoot over and you look, they look at the urchin like the urchin ain't said nothing. I've seen people ask to move their coat so somebody can sit down, but now they act as if, no, this coat is going to stay where it is. Just some bad attitude. Do you know your attitude determines your altitude? Just a good attitude will open some doors for you and make some waves for you. But he speaks of the attitude that every child of God should have. This word, bless, it means happy. It means satisfied. So it could read, happy are the poor in spirit. Now, we shun this word poor. We shun the idea, the precept, and concept of poverty. We don't want to have nothing to do with being poor. We don't want to even have any symbols of poverty and poor. But this is a good thing when it says, happy are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Because this word poor does not rub us the right way. But it eliminates arrogance, pride, and self-righteous. That when we come before God, hear me with your good ear, when we come before God, Every one of us are bankrupt. Every one of us is in need. From the pulpit to the pew. I don't care how long you've been in church, you're just as bankrupt as the person sitting next to you. All of us are in need when it comes to the Spirit of God. Every one of us are on equal stance and should be equal when it comes to our need for God because all of us are poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, four quick things here. The first thing I want to suggest as it relates to 
poor in spirit, it is recognizing our dependence. We are all depending on God. Somebody said one day at a time. But if you get good, you move from one day to one hour at a time. And you really get good, you move from one hour to one minute at a time, to one second at a time. You, you need to have a strong dependence and a healthy dependence on God. Poor in spirit speaks of our dependency. You never get above depending on God. Now I want to tell you, you be careful. The things you do all the time and things you got confidence in that you know how to do, that you get behind the wheel and drive and don't say a prayer, Lord, help me. Because you got confidence in your skill and all, that is still a level of dependency. Well, we're asking God, Lord, I need your, your help. And when I get on my motorcycle, when I'm putting on my boots and my glove and my helmet, I'm going through a ritual. And my ritual is, Lord, help me. Lead me, guide me, and protect me. Now, I'm riding pretty good now, but I'm not caught up in my own confidence. My confidence is in him. Even with preaching and teaching. When I come before you all, I never approach this pulpit without time in devotion and time in prayer. Because I'm not confident in who I am and what I can do. And as many times have I done this, I still need the Lord. You, you, you singers in the house, you male chords in the house, listen, you, whenever you get behind the mic, don't rest in your own strength and in your own power. You need the Lord. There ought to be a strong dependence on the Lord. I got some preachers who, who will go amen with this. The times in which you stand up here and you got a good message. You know it's a good message. But you stand on your own strength and on your own power. And you will flunk every time. But on the other hand, sometimes you can have a message that you know ain't that tight, ain't that good, ain't well written. But you give it to the Lord. And the Lord will do wonders when you learn how to lean on him. Boy, I'm trying to teach this, but I feel a, I feel a wheel turning here. If, if, if we shift, we just shift, y'all. I'm, I'm going to try to teach it, but I, I've learned how to depend on him. I'm not depending on my job. I'm not depending on my income. I'm not depending on my health. I am depending on the Lord. I wish I had about eight of y'all who know what it means to depend on him. And the text says, you're in a good place. Happy are those, blessed are those who depend on him, who have a, a, a poor spirit, but not only the poverty of spirit as it relates to this text, but it also, I want to suggest there is a depravity. You recognize your own depravity. You recognize your dependence, but then you recognize your depravity. This word depravity, it means corruption, evil, and perversion. And I know I'm going to miss some of y'all because some of y'all ain't never did nothing wrong and still ain't messing up. You are a paragon of righteous. You have a pseudo halo over your head. You are cousin to an angel. You don't ever mess up. 
do anything wrong, but there is a level of depravity that lives in us. We are naughty by nature. Paul said, when I want to do good, evil is always present. Why do I do what I shouldn't do and that that I should, I don't do? What is it about us? Well, this flesh is evil and wicked. That's why we need a, a new birth. That's why we need transformation because there in us lie no good thing. If God does not move in us, we lack everything. The good we do is the Christ in us. But if we're left to ourselves, Scripture declares all of us like sheep have gone to our own way, meaning that all of us are selfish. Isn't it amazing you never had to teach a child how to share? You never had to teach them how to share. Because they come here being selfish. They don't want to share. And that's the lesson that you have to teach them is how to, how to share and how to be a giver. So there is this depravity that lives in us that creates hierarchy. And we feel like we're more than somebody else. But the standard is not me or the person sitting next to you. The standard is Christ. And when we put ourselves up against Christ, all of us come short of the glory of God. So to be poor in spirit, we're dealing with dependency, deprivacy, but then thirdly, I want to suggest we're dealing with a deficiency. There is a lack, and there will always be a lack of resources when it comes to our lives. We just keep running short of something, if not everything. Have you lived long enough to discover you're not as smart as you think you are? Have life taught you that lesson yet? Keep living. Life going to teach you a lesson that you are not as smart as you think you are. Life going to also teach you a lesson that you're not as strong as you think you are. You think you can handle some things. Life got some things waiting on you that will make all of us fall to our knees. Consequently, you and I will find ourselves not only in depravity, not only depending, but we will find ourselves with this deficit yes, sir. Yes, sir. that we are deficient yes, sir. in everything. Strong, we're not strong, we're not wise. But not only that, here's the fourth. Yes, yes, sir. Got a few more things and we'll be done. I know here's my fourth point. Y'all thought we were getting ready to go. Here's the fourth one. To be poor in spirit is to acknowledge that without God, there is death. Not only is he the source of life, but he's also the sustainer of life. And without God, I can do nothing. Without God, I will fail. Without God, I will be like a ship without a sail. There ain't anybody besides me live long enough to know you need God and that you cannot make it without him. That to live without God, it is death. A couple of things I want to share with us before you go tonight to get a better understanding of what this poor in spirit is all about. There are a couple of examples in scripture I want us to look at. The first one I want us to look at is Luke 18 and verse 13. Luke 18 verse 13. And when you have it, say amen. I 
I want to go up to verse, verse 10. Two men went up unto the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. Y'all know who the Pharisee is. That was the religious person. That was the holy purchase. That was the righteous person. One was a Pharisee. The other was a publican. Y'all know what a publican is, right? That is the sinner. Uh, that is considered to be lower, the lowest of the lowest. Uh, in that, uh, as a tax collector, uh, they were considered enemies of the Jews because they united with uh, the Romans to tax and overtax the Jews. And so they were despised by their own people. They were unlike. So here's this, this publican. And this Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Listen how he prays, y'all. Lord, I thank thee that I am not as other men who are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this public. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. But watch what the publican does. He stood afar. He wouldn't even go near the temple. Stood afar, would not lift up so much his eyes, wouldn't lift his head to heaven, but just murdered off his breath, saying, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. Here is a picture of what it means to be poor in spirit. Two prayers here. One prayer says, God, I thank you I'm not like other men. I pay my tithes, I go to church, I sing in the choir. I'm better than he is. I thank God I'm not like. But the publican said, Lord, I just need mercy. Be merciful unto me a sinner. You know which one went away justified? The one who was poor in spirit. The one who knew he needed God. And he needed the mercy of God. It matters not how much we do and what we do. If we do not have a heart that has a spirit of poverty when it comes to God, God, I need you. I need less of myself and more of you. God, I need you. No matter how good I am, no matter what work I do, if I don't recognize that I'm poor in spirit when it comes to God, I need more of God. Let's give me another example. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 6 and 5, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6 and 5. Y'all stay with me here. This is a good teaching tonight. Isaiah 6, verse 6 and 5. Listen what the prophet Isaiah says. Then said I, woe is me. For I am under none of y'all. Y'all, this is a prophet. This is not a publican. This is not a sinner. This is a prophet who's supposed to know God. Supposed to be walking with God. God has ordained him a prophet. And here's what he cries out. Then he says, woe. Unto me, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, some people, when they get close to God in their mind, they're further away from people. And they think they're better than everybody else. But Isaiah, when he sees the Lord, the first thing he sees before he sees people, 
he sees himself. And the Bible should act and work as a mirror and not a window. I think I need to say that 52 more times. The Bible should work as a mirror and not a window. Window, you look out and see others. But a mirror, you should see yourself. And the closer you are to God, the more you are to see yourself and see how corrupt, wicked, evil, and unholy that you are. I know there are people who get excited about, oh, me and the Lord walk, me and the Lord talking all the time. And I know that's, that, that's some joy with that. That's a celebration with that, but there's all, say, a burden with that. Because the closer you get to God, you discover how unholy you are. Especially when you get in the presence of holiness. You discover how unrighteous you are. You get in the presence of righteousness. The closer you get to God, the more you ought to see yourself. This Bible study and this teaching is self-evaluation. But you know what we do when we, we at worship and when we're at church and Bible study, we be saying, ooh, so-and-so need to hear this. I'm going to get the CD, I'm going to get that, and I'm going to make sure that they get that message because they need to hear. No, you need to hear. And see how it fits in your life. And be the change that you want to see. Amen, somebody. So Isaiah sees himself, then he sees other people. And he cries out, woe is me, because he's in the presence of the Lord. Here's another example. Go to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, beginning with verse 5. Job 42. And five. Y'all stay with me. We're almost done. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen see thee. Verse six. Verse six is what we want. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Look at what Job says. Now y'all got to remember how this story, this narrative begins. Job chapter 1, we get Job is the, the most righteous, perfect man in all of us. But look how after what he went through, what he discovered about himself. He saw himself and he had to repent. Y'all do know Job cursed the day that he was born. Job questioned God. Job wanted to call God into cosmic court, and he had some words for God. Because the theology was that if you live right and do right, trouble wasn't supposed to come. And so Job is wrestling with, why is all of this happening to me? And if I can only find God, and if God can only answer. But after he went through his storm, not only did he experience a, a storm, but he saw himself and saw his own treachery and wickedness and downfall. Here's last an example here. Luke chapter 5, verse 8. Luke chapter 5, verse, verse 8. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, Depart from me. I am a sinful man, O Lord. Y'all know the narrative, the story that's happening here? They had tauled all night fishing. Couldn't get any fish. Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side. We don't get what was in Peter's mind, but from, from his repentance here, Peter kind of did one of our numbers. 
I don't know what the Lord telling me to do this for. We know how to fish. We've been fishing all night. And this carpenter by trade. We are fishermen by trade. He's a carpenter. And he want to tell us how to fish. We don't get all that from Peter. This, this is me hop rising because based upon his confession, he had need to repent when all the fish came up. He had need to repent. And if you look closely, the Lord says, cast your nets. as an S on nets. But when Peter casts, there's just a net. There's no S on that. There's no plurals of net. So Peter was reluctant to do what the Lord said. And that's where we get this word, nevertheless. It's your word. I got issues with what you say, but nevertheless. And because he did not believe God, did not believe Christ, he saw himself and saw his own sin. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not get better until we see ourselves. And we don't see nothing wrong with ourselves and we don't see no improvement. We're not challenged to do any better. We will stay in ourselves. That word is called to challenge us so we can see ourselves. And we can leave here saying, I got to do, got to do better. But let me wrap this up. Let me see if I can turn us up just a little bit in here. Because y'all uh, about to put me to sleep. I, maybe I need some discipline with teaching. Uh, but let, 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 me try to, let me try to turn the corner here. Three, three things here and real quickly, and we're done. Three things real quickly. He says... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for what is their reward? For theirs is the kingdom of God. He promised that if we are poor in spirit, he got a reward for us. That if you have the right attitude, God says, I have a blessing for you. And the blessing is the kingdom of God. What? does the kingdom of God incorporate? Three things and I'm out of your way. Hopefully, hopefully y'all blessed by this message. I, I, can, I can't tell right now standing here but maybe the fruits of the labor will come in later. What does the kingdom of God incorporate? It incorporates forgiveness. That we have the forgiveness of God. Imagine all the sins that you've done. And the wrong that you've done. Imagine all of that. But God's grace and mercy grants you forgiveness. Thank God for the kingdom of God that incorporates our forgiveness. And I thought I would get a better amen. Especially talking to sinful men and women who are in need of forgiveness. Their sin of commission and omission. Sin we know about, sin we don't know about. God has granted us forgiveness, but then not only forgiveness, the kingdom incorporates fellowship. That I have fellowship with God. God has promised fellowship. He's promised to walk with us and talk with us. He has promised to never, ever leave us alone. No, never alone. You are never by yourself. He has given you his fellowship, his presence. And I leave you with this last one. He has given you life forever. That is the kingdom of God.
that we are only living this life just to live again. Can you phantom forever? We, we can't even imagine forever. We don't even comprehend what forever look like because nothing on this side lasts. But there is a land that will never grow old. And a thousand years will be as one day. And one day will be as a thousand years. I'm on my way to that kingdom. Is there anybody on your way to that kingdom? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you again for your word tonight. We pray that your word did not fall on deaf ears. Shift us from becoming hearers to doers of your word. And Lord, we're going to embrace being poor in spirit. God, we need you. We can't make it without you. We need you every hour, every minute, and every second. Lord, we thank you now for your kingdom that is soon to come and your kingdom that is happening right now. We love you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Bless and praise. Our God, amen.